Welcome to season two of Gray Maybe, a limited series podcast and social experiment based on this season's topic, the body. My name is Jillian Schmitz. I'm a professional dancer, actor, teacher, author, artist, and cat lover. Through my own personal journey of recovery, I've found that things aren't just black or white, or as simple as yes or no. For me, in my recovery, there has been mostly gray area and a lot of maybes. In most of my stories, you can find the gray maybe. I will be sharing my own process through personal stories, interviews, and hopefully stories from listeners in an effort to help lessen the stigma and shame of disordered eating, eating disorders, and body image. If you'd like to share your story of ED recovery on this podcast, anonymous or otherwise, please email graymaybestories at gmail.com. G-R-E-Y-M-A-Y-B-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S at gmail.com. Before we get started, if you haven't already, please subscribe on whichever platform you're using to catch future episodes of Gray Maybe. A note before we begin. The topic of disordered eating, eating disorders, body dysmorphia, and other behavior related to the body may not be difficult for me to share anymore, but it wasn't always this way. I recognize and anticipate the possibility of judgment or disbelief about my experiences, ranging from my own family members to strangers, in addition to the potentiality of losing certain opportunities for publicizing my own experiences. My stories and the stories of others on this podcast are told through the lens of our own experience. The revelation of our process is ours to tell. If you disagree with the views or stories on this podcast, know that we are not speaking on anything other than our own experiences and viewpoints. Take what you like and leave the rest. Nothing expressed or mentioned in this podcast is an endorsement or is meant to be taken as suggestion or advice. It is strictly the sharing of our own experiences and recovery. Any feelings this podcast activates in the listener is for the listener to process and recover from. Any criticism you have based on these experiences and choices are yours, and they are not anyone else's burden to carry. Trigger warning, eating disorders, disordered eating, anorexia, restriction, dieting, cleanses, fat phobia, weight gain and loss, adoption, child loss, pet loss, binging, purging, anxiety, depression, explicit and graphic language, and abortion. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Gray Maybe podcast. Thank you so much for coming back. Um, I love it when people come back and listen. I love that people have been listening and telling me they're listening because it's a little bit like an echo chamber once I put these episodes out. Today is really exciting. I have a very, very... I... You're going to see. Okay. So I have... uh, For those of you who know me, know me, you know that I have spent a majority of my career doing a lot of burlesque work. Yes, I work in TV and film, professional dancer, assistant choreographer, whatever. But I have a whole side hustle of doing burlesque work in clubs and bars. I ended up being getting able to do some of that on TV later in my career. But I have always loved and so much of my bread and butter has been doing burlesque. And whereas I did not meet this guest today on the burlesque stage or in the burlesque dressing room, I met her through my path in in recovery and found out that she was a very, very cool burlesque dancer. And that's how I met her in the rooms of OA for Overeaters Anonymous, which is not just overeaters. It's all food and body stuff. And then I found out she was a burlesque star and her burlesque name is Ambrosia Minge. So just think about that for one second. Ambrosia Minge. For those of you who don't know, in the U.S., a minge is a slang term for the pubic region of a female's anatomy, maybe like uh, pubic hair, pubic area. So her stage name is Ambrosia Minge. Minji, I'm going to call her Minji and Minge pretty much the whole episode. Minji, welcome. 
Hi. to the Grain Maybe podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting. It's so weird to listen to a podcast for so long and then like, I'm going to be on a podcast? That's insane. And you have been a longtime supporter. You supported right at the go, right in my first season, which if you're just jumping into this season or this episode, know that there's an entire, um, I think seven or eight episode season solely on the topic of abortion and my experience with abortion and other people who were willing to write in their experience of abortion and culturally. And I knew Minji's, I, I knew your political outlooks and some of your feelings about things, although abortion, don't get me wrong, it should not be political. It shouldn't even be a, polar, a, a politically polarizing topic. However, I did know your position on that. But you were so into that podcast. You let me know right away. It was so warm and lovely. Like, And I knew you aligned with those types of conversations, but I knew that you were a very, very consistent, very loyal listener from the very beginning. And I'm so glad you've continued to listen this season because I know this might hit harder or closer to home since that's how we met. And I'm so glad that you're still involved in listening and being willing to come on the podcast. Oh my God. I, again, I support... You know, as a female, of course, we all have a history with abortion, no matter mm -hmm. what the instances are. Um, mm -hmm. But I think also, you know, body image and things. Again, as a female in this world, it's a bit, it's a big part of how we walk out the door every day. So it really is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, going back to how we met and um, away with our clothes sure, on. With their clothes on, which is not normally how you meet a lot of our friends in our business. And even in the professional dance world, for people who are not in the burlesque world, you might meet a fellow dancer while they're lifting you in the air with their hand in precarious places. You're like, hello, nice to meet you. What's your name? Okay, are you going to lift me? Okay, cool. Where's your hand? Got it. Got it. You know, a lot of our business is not very... Um, corporate. Uh, there's not a lot of HR involved in our situations. Not uh, when you're doing pussy checks backstage. Nope. No. Nope. And, and for those of you who don't know what a pussy check <laughs> is, that is when you bend over. Usually you bend over. You kind of squat or bend over. And then you ask a, a fellow friend of in the dressing room to check. It's usually like a tampon check, a pussy check. You just want to make sure everything's where it should be which is inside the costume. That's where we want it to be. Yep. Um, and sometimes you need a friend to take a look for you for that. So, And that happens not just in burlesque. That happens uh, backstage in many dressing rooms uh, across the U.S. and the world. <laughs> I don't know what it is in every other language, but I know what's happening. So now, why now why did you decide uh, to go to OA? Like, what, what was your journey into getting to OA? Because I actually don't know that journey for you. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, when I share my story in meetings, I, one of my first memories is um, as a little kid, um, uh, anxiety around not enough food because of the, the situation in my home. And um, even to the extent of, as a child, like saving my allowance, lying to my grandfather and saying, oh, my mom wants you to get us some of those little packages of chips that go into our lunches. And at the age of seven, I thought I was, quote unquote, hiding them in my pajama drawer, of course, forgetting my mom's the one who put my pajamas in that drawer. And I would literally like during the course of the day at school, be like, I can't wait to get home because I get to have one of my bags of chips that no one else got to take. Mm -hmm. So uh, my house was a very active place. My, my parents were very political. And it was not unusual that during, from the time that my mom made our lunches at night to when you woke up the next morning, someone may have eaten it. Mm. And so you didn't have your lunch. So it, it created this sense of like, I better eat it now or it's not going to be there. Or I better get it and hide it. Um, and then that kind of started that idea of like, you know, working the system, how to get as much food as possible um, to my own experience with my body and my and I remember being like in sixth or seventh grade and going to the doctor and the doctor and I was, you know, by then I had my period and I had boobs and all that stuff because I'm half Cuban and God blesses us with that early. Um, uh, and the doctor literally saying, oh, I'm not very happy with your shape. What the fuck? Yeah. The male doctor who was smoking 
Stop it. Telling me, well, because I'm old. I just turned 60. So um, he, he wasn't. And we can see how that aged, like how, yes. how ridiculous that sounds nowadays, right? Yeah. But, but he wasn't happy with my shape. And that started diets. And that started mm-hmm. literally, I think all of like sixth grade, my lunch was a piece of beef jerky and a can of tab. You know? Oh my gosh. And then it just kind of, it went from there. And it, you know, those of us who have disordered eating, some of us are only blessed with one shade. Some of us get all the colors. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I got restriction as well as binging. Um, And uh, I would say through most of my 20s, it was a lot of extreme restricting Mm -hmm. um, to the point of, I remember passing out in a department store because I hadn't eaten for like two weeks Mm. and the, the security guard was trying to feed me crackers and I literally punched him because (gasps) I didn't want any food going in my mouth. And I love the master cleanse. Oh, I've done claim to fame master cleanse 45 days. Um, And I will tell you even now, um, you know, in program, we have this thing where we're advised to create a red, yellow, green list. Mm-hmm. You know, red light foods, no, yellow, be cautious, green, go ahead, have a good time. In mm-hmm. my mind, the ideal red, yellow, green, the only thing in the green section would be water. And then mm-hmm. I would have made it. Then I would be perfect. Now, I have a follow-up question. When you passed out in the department store and you came to with the crackers being force-fed, do you recall, like, now with a mind's eye that might be more objective, what was your body shape? Were you very, very thin? Were you normal? Or what would be average? What what people would consider average? I don't know, whatever that is. But you know what I'm... There's, like, this generalized idea. Or were you, like, a larger-bodied person at that time? No, I was, I was like 20 years old, 19, 20 years old, and I was a size 10. Now, I so am 5'3", a- but most of it was boob and butt because, again, but. <laughs> well, and this is why I had a feeling about that because there's two things. So I'm going to come back. This is, I'm going to try not to make this lengthy. So I have a slight confession to make. And I believe, I I believe this to be true. I I'm trying to pace back to like my thought process when I met you and being in the rooms. Um, You may be the first person. This is embarrassing to say, okay, this is so embarrassing, but it's so fucking important. Everybody listen, listen up and listen and start telling other people this story. You might be the first person that I saw that I heard you talk And I thought, and I looked and I said, oh my God, people who are larger body um, could be anorexic, could be restricting as bad as a hundred pound anorexic. And I did not know that as someone who's, who was actively restricting and still not skinny. um, I mean, thin, uh, probably overly thin to most people, but like the type of thin that I wanted, the type of thin that would qualify me as an anorexic, I was not able to attain no matter how little I ate. Now, I heard in what you would tell in these meetings and I would look at you and I was like, oh my God, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like it, you can't look at anybody and know what they are going through and know what they're doing. And so the reason I'm asking you at... 20 years old, passing out in a department store and someone force feeding you crackers, you were a size 10 ish. So someone looking at you would say, oh, you're healthy. You're normal. You're not eating. You haven't eaten in two weeks. You are by definition anorexic, but you don't look anorexic. So therefore there is no emergency. You're just fine. And that only gets worse as someone's body takes up more space or is larger. So this is such a fucking hard thing to explain to people because when I say to people, there can be larger body people who are anorexic, they, it, it's like it goes over their head and they're like, yeah, it, no, like they cannot digest it. Like there is such a, it, it's a, an immediate roadblock in their thought pattern. Yeah. And when I follow up and I say, no, I'm serious, there can be people who are not eating They don't lose weight and they are in a larger body and people cannot digest that because they it's been so ingrained that if you're larger body, there's only one way you got there. 
and there's only one or two reasons why you can't why you can't get out of it. And it's nothing could be further from yeah. the truth that is so much more complex. So Yeah. Very true. That's a, a lot of me talking. I don't want to talk. <laughs> I I'm supposed to not talk. I'm just supposed to host. So but I have to say that because I recall you being that first person for me and I hate that I had to have a first person and I hate that I had to be in my 30s to have that experience. But I need everybody to know that who's listening and I need everybody to repeat that to at least five people and then they need to repeat it to five people minimum. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm not going to take up more of your questions. Let me let me move <laughs> For, oh, sorry, I, and I interrupted you. So you weren't even done with your story. No, no, so. no, that's fine. And, and and the people listening need to know that Jillian and I haven't gotten to talk with each other for a long time. So this is also the equivalent of us brushing each other's hair and gabbing. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. It's our girls' night. It's our girl time. Yeah. So yeah. because pre-pandemic, we got this like once a week. We yes. went to the same meeting, and then we would usually go to yeah. like a fellowship afterwards, or at least bare minimum, we would catch up after the meeting. Yeah. So. Yeah. You got as far as passing out on the department room floor. You had done the cleanse. You had done all the things. Oh, and I did so much more than that. I mean, it, even as it went on, um, uh, you know, I was in a normal size body. And I remember my boyfriend at the time uh, bought me a membership to his gym so that we could meet at the gym and work out together. And I'm like, oh, that's so great. And then I got into the exercise bulimia situation. And again, I've. I eventually got myself down to a size six. And again, I'm five, three. Well, I'm five, two and three quarters, but I grabbed that extra quarter inch because why not? Um, I got so crazy about it that I would go to the gym early, take two aerobics classes, go to the showers, take a shower, change my clothes, go back, sit out in my car, wait for my boyfriend to show up and act like I had just gotten there so that we could go in and work out together. Holy shit. Yeah. I mean, I was, yeah. So much energy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, and yeah, and the, and lit, and surviving off of like Diet Coke and microwave popcorn. Cause again, it's that time in your 20s where like you're super poor. Um, and, and, and you're female. So you're not supposed to eat a lot and, and all these other things. And, and I remember, I didn't know if I was at a part. Someone said, oh, my God, you're so nice and thin. And I literally, it was like I turned around and went, I may be thin, but I am far from fucking nice. Because I was so crazy and holding mm -hmm. on to that weight just with such a death grip mm -hmm. of all the insanity um, that went with it. And the energy, mm -hmm. like you said, the energy and that that constant calculation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, I mean, how crazy is it to go to, I mean, I was taking two aerobics classes to the point where the teacher was like, I can't come in tomorrow. Can you teach the class for me? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, but like, and I'm fairly certain that my ex would not have cared if I'd been sitting there in sweaty clothes, but in my mind, I had to create this illusion that like, oh, oh my God, I just got here. I'm so sorry. No, I just gone through two aerobics classes. It's definitely not uncommon yeah. for us to hide our behavior or what we're doing or lie yeah. about it all, all under the guise of like, because we know inherently that that's not normal, right? Yeah. You don't lie about things unless you don't want someone to know the truth. Exactly. And the reason you don't want someone to know the truth is because you know that it's not right. Yeah. Um. So then, so you're that was like further on in it. You've got down to a size six, and you you're doing this extreme amount of yeah energy output. And then, what what came after that? And then the pendulum swings. And I, for myself, what I can look at is the weekend that I gave away my dog, and it brought up all the old feelings of giving up my baby. Mm. And I went to Trader Joe's and I bought all of the groceries for the week mm -hmm. and I ate them all in one day. Mm. And then I was off to the races. Right. And it's, it's gone up and down and up and down, you know, and I've tried all different kinds of things, all different, all different magical combinations that I thought were going to be the solution, not just to the body weight, but to the crazy. Yeah. 
Yeah. I was never as sick as I was the months and maybe year following my first abortion. Incredible. And, and this was, and I did not have a baby to term. I did not give it away, but that decision and the morality around it and the, you know, I, that was, I don't know if I talked as much too about in that story about how much had I been in a different financial place, maybe I would have made different decisions. Yeah. And how much, so much of finances or the ability to be a woman and still have your dreams. Yeah. That that weighs in so much in our decision-making process, which isn't a decision, right? If you don't have, it, it's not really a decision if it's not at your disposal. That's not really choice, right? If you have to give up a baby or if you, and I don't know your circumstances, um, and or if you have to choose to have an abortion because you're not supported, which so many women aren't, right? They don't have enough support. They don't have enough money. They don't have enough childcare. They don't have enough, they haven't been able to attain their dreams. And now they certainly wouldn't be able to, you know, like yeah. all of those things. That's not really a choice. The yeah. choice would be if you have all the money, if you have all the dreams, if you have all the support and you still choose, no, not for me. Yeah. That would be a choice. That's a choice. Yeah. That's a choice. So, and the reason, like, I'm really glad you brought that up. And I'm like the emotional aspect of what was going on in your life when things took the other swing the other way, you know, and, and w like usually, and I could be wrong, but usually people who are acting out with behaviors of eating disorders, it's not out of the blue and it's not for nothing. Yeah. You may not be aware of why in the moment, but it is to disassociate and distract from something else that is very terribly terrible that you're not either not ready to deal with or you don't want to deal with the feelings about it. You know, eating disorders so much have to do with I'm going to restrict I don't want so that I don't have to feel the feelings or binging. I want to get rid of the feelings or, you know, um, or sorry, purging to get rid of the feelings, binging to like s help satiate to feed myself for emotionality, to numb out, to feel fed, to feel supported, you know, like, so it's a very emotional situation. And that's hard to connect sometimes early in recovery. But that's yes. really what what goes on. So so that was where you swung the other way. Yeah. And then and that lasted for a little while. And then again, you know, then I, I, you know, go to the extreme. of, And I remember this, I was probably in my 30s by the time I went into the next huge restricting phase. And I would get up every morning. And in the shower, I would recite to myself, food is the enemy, food is the enemy, food is the enemy. And that's what would go not just in my head, like I would say it out loud. Mm -hmm. And that's how I would go out into the world. Right? You're going to war. Yep. Yeah, basically. I relate to that. Yeah. And so then at what point did you have like, um, was there a moment of like, holy shit, I need help. I'm out of control. Or was it, you know, was there any kind of a, how did you find your way into the rooms or any kind of like recovery start? Well, interestingly enough, it was, I was, um, my, my boyfriend that I was with at the time, his mother, uh, is an extreme collector. I don't use the H word because that has shame around it. And I have worked professionally as an organizer and things like that. And the family would make fun of her. They had a beautiful home in Pasadena. It was one rac. I used to tell her it was one raccoon away from Grey Gardens. Like mm. they couldn't use the living room. because. And the funny thing was the thing she collected mostly food. Mm. Yeah. Food. It, it was so you saw that. And the day that I was trying to help her let go of some of the 80 bottles of barbecue sauce that she had collected, I could see what was happening. And I realized, oh, my God, I understand what she's going through. Right. You're and, like, this is really close to home. <laughs> and he also had a brother who was a drug addict. And mm -hmm. I watched his brother struggle. And I was like, you know, we need to get him help. And I think, wait a minute. I need to get me help. Mm. And I realized, and I had, I had, you know, in my career gone to therapists and stuff like that, but I'm very smart. 
Mm-hmm. And I would just jerk these therapists around and pay them. Right, money. right. You know, Especially they, if you're not ready to really like dive in. And honestly, on any given day, I ain't ready. I got to tell yeah. you that. Yeah. You like, know, they'd give me the food diary and I would show up an hour early to the appointment with six different colored pens and fill it in with a different colored ink. So it looked like I had been filling it out every day. Oh, you sneaky. Oh, girl. I know how to, you know, yeah. But I just, I realized that like, you know, and to a certain extent, I valued the relationship that I was in. And I thought if this relationship has any chance, I've got to get help with this because I don't want to be that lady. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be the lady that's storing potatoes in her bathroom. Mm -hmm. I can't go there. Um, And so I went, I, I. I knew that going to a therapist or going to group therapy wasn't going to work because I tried that already. And I knew that his brother had been going to um, program for the drug issue. And I thought, you know, I just looked it up. I found it. And I went to a meeting at the log cabin in West Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And um, I that's want- a very prestigious place. Thank People you. talk about. People talk about that meeting in different programs, too. The Log Log Cabin. Cabin. Yes, in Hollywood, yes. And um, I wanted to punch everyone in the meeting in the skull. Mm -hmm. That's normal. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. I stayed, and I heard people who looked like you, people who looked like me, all Mm -hmm. telling the same story Mm -hmm. of all the crazy things that they had done around food. Mm Mm-hmm. I didn't hear anyone going, I just really love the taste of this thing. It was like, no, 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 that's not what this is about. This is not about the taste of anything or a favorite. That's not how this Mm -hmm. is. And Mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, um, well, you know, just uh, have have a glass of ice water after, you know, it wasn't like tips and tricks. Right. This was like people down and dirty. You know, it's so funny. We talked about like seeing your coworkers naked in burlesque. I got to mm-hmm. see all these people naked because they just stripped it off and told the story. You know, that is, I love that you make that direct link because I spent so much of my career taking off my clothes and exposing myself, which I love. Um, and now that I'm old, I'm not retired by any means and I still want to do all that, but I have decided to uh, emotionally expose myself. That's what this later part of my life has kind of started. And so I'm glad you made that connection because that's exactly what it is. And I was shocked by hearing everybody's internal dialogues and behavior that was also the same. Like, even if it's not exact things you said or did, you were like, yeah, yeah, I get why you might do that. Oh, yeah, I've definitely felt like that. Or, oh, yeah, that's exactly my mind frame. And it had nothing to do with body sizes or behavior is that the brains were all the same. I mean, there, so that was, go ahead. There used to be a meeting there. It was a women's meeting and it was a, can, it said it was a candlelight meeting. It was actually a candlelight meeting. Um, they'd mm-hmm. light one candle and put it in the middle of the table. And it was the only meeting I could share at because I didn't have to make eye contact with anyone. Mm-hmm. And I remember being in that meeting and a woman came in and she did not look well. She was in a thin body, beautiful mm-hmm. woman. And she shared and she shared through tears how all she had eaten for the last two weeks was sheet cake from the grocery store. Mm. And she talked about how she would go get a sheet cake and eat it. And she would keep track of which store she got it out so that she could rotate and go to the because she was fairly certain all the people in the grocery store remembered. And they'd wonder why Mm. was she here buying another sheet cake? She was just here. And I totally related to that because I used to go do my grocery shopping at 2 a.m., because I didn't want anyone to see or to see mm-hmm. anyone I knew seeing mm-hmm. what I was buying at the grocery store. And I'm like, I totally get that story. And here's this perfect, beautiful model looking lady, except her hair looked like shit because all she'd been eating was sugar for two weeks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And she, she, her brain worked like my brain. Mm-hmm. Again, it's like, there's no rhyme or reason. The outside does never, you have no idea what's going on inside. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Um, And how did you even know about OA? Like, how did you even know to like, oh, there's a log cabin meeting? Well, I knew that there was 12 step programs. Um, okay. And I just I just looked up eating and I think Alcoholics Anonymous and somehow it kicked me to Overeaters Anonymous. 
And I just, that one happened to be where, near where I lived, because I lived in the Mid-Wilshire area at the time. I also knew it was right down the street from the Abbey, so I could go mm-hmm. get a, I could go get a drink after if yep. I wanted to. Yep, yep. So in these, like, I would call this like an early recovery time, right? Because, and this is the thing, like, recovery is so gray. I've said that a million times or way, I've said that in different ways on this podcast. Um, But once you've taken an initial step, and I don't care what that is, I don't care if it's like you're looking at yourself and saying, I don't want to have hoard, sorry, I said the H word. I don't want to fill my bathroom with a bunch of potatoes because I'm having a problem. If that's it, or if it's like, you know, seeing yourself in, in a situation like you did, if it's, you know, making the decision to go to some kind of either therapy, group therapy, 12 step program. Um, that's like an early recovery time. You've taken the first steps, right? You're like looking around, you're realizing you're taking inventory. You're like, okay, something's not right. I need a little bit of help. I need to figure something out. And in that early recovery time, like, what did that look like for you? A lot of people, it's not an overnight thing, but there are things that start to shift and change really slowly. And sometimes it's really kind of, for me, everything amped up. Like, it was almost like now every meal became a fucking fight because I actually was trying to have a meal. And and then it was also like, because I would wait so long before I'd eat and then I would eat, I didn't even know really, and I still struggle with this, like what is a normal size meal for me? Because unfortunately I will eat everything on my plate because I, I, I don't know if it's just conditioning of growing up in the Midwest or like I don't want to waste anything or I, I don't know what that is, but I plate large. I put a lot of stuff on my plate and then I, I make myself eat it all even if it's too much for me. So I'm now really trying to like plate less and be like, you can always go back for more, you know, tell myself that it will wait, wait after you're done. And I have to talk to myself like a baby, just finish your plate. Is it take this off? Are you, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. Why don't you just try the first plate? And then if you're yeah. still hungry, you can have seconds, right? Because I still really struggle with that. Um, so in that early recovery time, do you remember anything about that that you want to share? Well, the thing that I went in very cocky because um, by the time I went into program, I had been a vegetarian for 20 years, 25 years. And I thought, wow. well, if I could give that up, I, this is going to be, you know, and I, I never had a moment of like, oh, I, I know people who say, oh, I'm a vegetarian, but I, I go have a cheeseburger once a week. I've never done that. Mm-hmm. But the reason I'm a vegetarian is because I don't want to eat my cats. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to eat anything I can have as a pet. And right. as as the the interweb has shown us, you can have a crab as a pet. You can have a praying right, mantis right. as a pet. I would not want to eat any of those things. Right. Um, so I thought, oh, this is not going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got my my first sponsor was actually a man. And um, that is a big no, no. Normally, you're not allowed to do that. Just so people know she got away with it. OK, yes, go I ahead. I got away with it. And um, I had to call in my food every morning. Mm-hmm. And I would, I remember, I specifically remember calling in my food and fixing my lunch to take to work with me and then getting in the shower. And I fixed the lunch. I'm like, oh, great. This is exactly what I told my sponsor I'm going to eat. I got took a shower, got dressed, walked in. And I'm like, and then I went and asked, my, I'm like, Michael, did you eat half of my lunch? Because this does not seem like the right amount of food. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My perception when I was zeroed in on it, oh, this is fine. Mm-hmm. When I came back in about 25 minutes, suddenly right. it seemed like way less food. Right. When you um, were actually hungry and ready to eat, all of a sudden it's like, this can't possibly satiate me. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and I, um, again, because of the way I grew up, it wasn't like, you know, arm around my food, grr, but it was like, you know, find it, eat it as fast as possible so no one else can take it. Um, you know, so there's a lot of that. It was a lot of like, get it in as fast as possible. And that is a real thing. So lack and limitation around food. Um, 
there was a book called Intuitive Eating, and this gets a bad rap. Like, I feel like people misuse the word intuitive eating as far as like, I'm going to go with my gut and what my gut wants me. Like, am I, you know, like there's this idea that like, oh, I'm going to go with what I'm craving as intuitive eating. And that's not at all what intuitive eating is. Intuitive eating is actually, the book is based on a bunch of scientific research done about the brain and how the brain reacts when you are faced with the lack and limitation of something or being on a diet and how it profoundly and irreversibly oftentimes screws up your mind and digestive um, bridge. So your brain tells your body to digest hormones, help with that. I'm butchering all this. Please read the book if you want more real information. But basically, so taking that idea of lack and limitation is when the human brain thinks it has lack. Now, this can be presented many different ways. It can be like, I don't have food. I'm in a household that is food insecure. And if I don't eat it, someone else is going to eat it. Or if I don't get it in first, my sibling's going to take it from me. Or if if there isn't enough, I'm going to miss out. What that does to the brain is all it does is fixate on getting as many calories and as much food and as much of that thing as possible to survive. It is a survival mechanism. So it's like if you were out in the middle of nowhere trying to survive and you realize that like your main source of food, let's say it was Uh, bananas. Let's say you're in a jungle. It's bananas. And all of a sudden there's no bananas. Well, you better bet that you're going to want bananas more than you've ever wanted in your life. And you're going to start seeking it and you're going to start looking for it and you're going to start moving. You're going to move to a different area in the jungle. You're going to keep looking. Where are my bananas? Where are my bananas? I really want bananas. That's what the brain does to basically ensure survival. But the same thing happens if you tell yourself, I'm not going to have chocolate. I'm not going to have any I'm not going to have any bread products. I'm not, I'm no bread products for me. I guarantee you all you're going to want and think about for the next week is bread products or chocolate or whatever you've told yourself because that's how the brain works. So when you talk about lack as a child, that is real and it will, it will haunt your whole life because you will constantly be like, I need to have, I need to have, I need to have. Um, that totally checks out. I will link intuitive eating the book. Um, at the bottom for anybody who's interested. It may not be your cup of tea, but I found it to be very scientific and not scientific in a way of like the BMI index of the blah, 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 Department of Health and Wellness Agriculture. No, 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 no. This is a lady who did specific research on the brain and what the brain does with the body with diets and digestion. Okay. So I took you way off the the (laughs) path of what, what we were talking about. Um, I think you were you were talking a bit about you might have to bring me back. Well, I was talking a little bit about my sponsor. Yes. Oh, and one my... last thing. Keep that. Sorry, I, I'm not going to interrupt anymore. I promise. I promise, no, Minji. Okay. I won't do it. I get Listen. to look at you while you're talking, so oh, I'm very no, no, happy. No, no. <laughs> Listen. So, 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 one thing just for people who are listening might not be familiar with twelve step programs. If you decide to get a sponsor, each sponsor is different. Each program is different. So, what she's describing is something that her sponsor asked her, but it's not like you get a sponsor and this is the exact thing that you might be asked. So, just so you know, it's a very flexible program. It's a very kind and loving problem. A very gentle program. Um, and it's very different for everyone. So, okay. Yes. So your sponsor said, write this stuff down. You came back from the shower and you're like, this is not enough. This is not enough food. Um, but yeah, I think because I would call him every morning and tell him what my food for the day was. And then if, if I made a change, I could just text him and say, well, instead of the salad, I'm having this or something. Um, and it actually start, and I have to kind of back up a little bit. Um, I used to have a theory that um, my uh, a previous ex was like, he said, every time you cook, it's like Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. It's toast and popcorn and pretzel. St- it's like, it's never like a piece of this. And some of the- it's like my whole life was just snacks, mm. you know, um, and that's kind of how I ate. Um, and. Now I started to have started had to create meals. Oh, so he was commenting on the fact that like you're not actually eating meals. You're eating snacks as meals. Yeah. So you had to like do a whole different thing. So not in addition to stopping addictive behavior and feelings and thoughts and blah, blah, blah. You actually have to learn a whole new skill. Yes. I have to start having a protein and a grain and and vegetables and all of that kind of stuff. And um the thing that that really pointed out to me was that if I was having friends over for dinner, I'd stand for three hours on my feet making dinner for them. 
Mm -hmm. But I could not stand standing in the kitchen for 30 minutes preparing a meal for myself. Like Same. literally my body got hot just thinking about it. I didn't get that extreme, but I was like, it's not worth it. Why would I spend that time for me? Yeah. That's a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah. So that that was definitely something. And and I really liked my sponsor until it suddenly dawned on him that I was a chick. <laughs> and what, what do you mean? He didn't he didn't. It took, why did it take him a while? I don't know. But one day he's just like, you know what? He said, I realized I can't do this. You're female. I'm male. I'm like, yeah, that has not changed since we started. So I don't know what happened. Um, so, yeah. But then I got another sponsor and this sponsor you know, didn't really, wasn't so much focused on my food plan as they were me doing step work. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm, and I'm so grateful for that spot. Cause like they gave me my first big book. Mm -hmm. Um, they worked with me through step three, where we actually almost came to blows over the GOD word. Mm -hmm. Um, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and that, that I have to say, was really the most when people ask me about you know oh is 12 step for me I said well would you like to spend a year where you've literally peeled off all your skin and people are going to throw salt on you because that's what it's going to be like. <laughs> <laughs> sounds very appealing what a pitch what a pitch minge and that's uh, where why do I'm I not sign a sponsor up? yeah yeah <laughs> where do I sign up but I mean that's really what it felt like it, for some reason tr transitioning into doing step work, I literally felt like I had peeled off all my skin. And thank God I had a sponsor who answered her phone anytime I called three mm. o'clock in the morning. Ah! Wow. Wow. You know, yeah. I was so lucky to have that sponsor. Um, and that she would, and she, she knew how crazy I was going. Cause it was that first year of like really diving into all that step work. Oh my God. I literally felt like I'd been turned inside out. I love that you talked about feeling inside out, skin peeled off, and salt being poured on. Because although I didn't feel that way doing step work, I felt that way in early recovery. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, they I've said this before and I'll say it again, that recovery is the unthawing of grief. Because what happens is when you actually take away or you start investigating the behaviors and the disorder or the dis-ease yeah. of whatever you're using, everything comes up that has been waiting and okay. that you think you've been kind of pushing down or not dealing with, or I totally right. deal with that. I totally think about that. It's fine. No, no, no. You have nothing now to block it out. So it just comes up and everything feels so much harder to deal with. Everything feels like you're so exposed. It feels yeah. like a raw wound with salt. And I know a lot of alcoholics talk about that, um, you know, when they stop drinking because they don't, now they have to like raw dog life, you know, they have to like just take it as what we call life on life's terms. Um, and so that is a thing that happens. And if you're early in recovery or if you're even like had a relapse and you're going through recovery again, or if you're just even in like a rough patch of your recovery, yeah. um, if you don't experience that, yay. But if you do, that's, right on. That's normal. That's exactly where you should be. Unfortunately, it's part of the process. Just hang on. Um, so I'm glad you talked about that. So then going forward from there, um, I'm guessing you got that second uh, sponsor. You Did you go through all the steps? Um, I think we got up to like step five and then they, they moved away. Um, and then I got another sponsor who turned out not to be the sponsor for me because I am a but why person right. and at one point I frustrated her so much that she, that she just said well maybe program's not for you because I kept asking questions right. um so I've had a few sponsors and you know the thing that I will tell people in program and I think sometimes this just applies to life in general um I am not perfect at program I cannot quote big book to you at all I mean, I know it and I can tell you some of my favorite stories, but I can't quote like on page, blah, 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 this, but I've never stopped going to meetings. Mm -hmm. No matter what, I've never stopped going to meetings. I, I am of service. Um, when I first went into program, I dove into being involved with the birthday party because I am, because of my background, 
I'm an over over volunteer. -er. I will mm. over volunteer for mm -hmm. things. Sir, I would listen to people talk in meetings about it's so hard to do service. I'm like, it is so hard to not do service. What are you talking mm -hmm. about? Right. Um, you know, and but the but the thing that that I came to learn as you start to and and I, I I'm going a little bit off of the topic too though is like you know, this concept that we actually, you know, your quote unquote gut instinct is some people believe you actually have a second brain in your stomach. Mm -hmm. And suddenly my second brain was able to think because I wasn't just dumping food in it all the time. And suddenly mm -hmm. I started to have instincts that like had my well-being in mind, you know, decisions that I was making and things like that. Um, and it just... Uh, <laughs> And I, I do. Re and it wasn't an easy time. I mean, it really wasn't. And I remember my boyfriend at the time just looking at me going. And so when are you going to be well? And right. How long do I need to wait this out for? And and I remember someone in program going, yeah, that relationship probably not still going to be in that relationship in a while. And it's not. And that's fine. Um, but just. And I say this in meetings a lot is and and I did lose weight. Um, but I wish someone would make a machine to measure how much crazy I have let go of. Right. Because it is voluminous in comparison to what I could get off of this body that I walk around in. Right. There is no measurement to show other people how much, how much mental weight you lost. And I think that is universal for everyone who's been in any program, yeah. has battled any kind of thing, is how much mental weight they've lost. But yeah. it's not, unless you really know someone really well, like you're living with them and you can see how much they're struggling or not or how much it affects their life, even then, they're not in your brain. So they don't hear the frequencies and what the dialogue is. Yeah. Um, what an excellent point. Yeah. Um, because now, if people aren't, this isn't a visual medium podcasting. Typically, I will put a short clip up um, on the social media, but you're a larger bodied woman. Yes. And so like when people see you now and today, like exactly right. They have no idea if you're just looking at you and you have a very archaic idea or very black and white idea, very archaic idea of A, what health is, what body shape should be, uh, and, and it's not flexible at all and it has nothing to do with actual health, yeah. um, but more in stigma and fat phobia or whatever that is, like someone might be like, oh, you may not be healthy, but your brain is oh. so much more healthy. And also I have learned through research, talking to people, knowing people, talking to doctors, talking to people who do this, like, being smaller is not being healthier. For some people, maybe, but it's not for everybody. No. And for me to be a smaller size than what I am now, I have to go through a lot of, I have to go through extreme measures. So, and that's just for me, and I am a curvier, more normal body type. So, but for me to manipulate that to get smaller, I have to go through some measures that would be extreme and I got to say, my blood work now is better than I was back when I was doing all of my things. Yeah. So I can say I am probably more healthy now, but I do have more weight on me now. And I don't even know what the BMI would say about me. It might say that I'm, you know, got problems. I don't know because I don't uh, subscribe to that bullshit. Yeah. But so now, today... What would you say like your relationship today is to food, to your body, to to this? I don't know how we want to address it. The eating disorder, disease, disorder, whatever, dis. And I say dis-ease. I say that as two different words because yeah. disease is one word, but dis-ease is in that word. And I do think a majority of our stuff in this realm comes from not having ease, not yeah. feeling ease. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, um, you know, uh, the one thing that I, that I think I've really learned through program is, you know, and, and back to, you know, when are you going to be better? When are you going to be well? Um, I have nothing but the rest of my life to handle any of this stuff that's coming at me. Um, it is an onion. 
that is being peeled. Um, but the reality is, this is no one else's experience but mine. Mm -hmm. So if you look at me and you don't like the way I look, I don't really give a fuck. I don't mm -hmm. really care. Um, you know, I can say that I have been over two and a half years with no pizza. Now, to most people, they think like that's not a big deal. Um, that's a big deal. But excuse me, me ma'am. That's a big deal. That's a big fucking deal. You say in me, you know, he pizza's the best boyfriend I ever had. He's hot, he's cheesy, <laughs> and he shows up when I call. <laughs> um but I have no desire for pizza. Mm -hmm. I literally other people can eat it in front of me. I know that it's six dollars and ninety-five cents to get a cheese pizza at Little Caesars, and trust me, I'm you know. Like the alcoholic that will drink the cheapest hooch you can possibly get. Doesn't matter. I don't care mm -hmm. about that. I just need, no, don't need, I don't need it. Don't mm -hmm. need it. Not and is that mind. like a, that's a uh, obsession that might've been lifted for you? I think so. You know, it yeah. was, was, I had heard someone talk about the red, yellow, green light foods again. Mm -hmm. And so, and they said, well, you can't just put all of these things because then you're going to look at that and go, oh my God. And then all you're going to do is want all those things in that red light list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They said, pick the top five in each category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And pizza was the top one because that was my one. Because when... When I would do extreme restricting and then fall off, pizza was where I went. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, that's the one I need to work on. And I just sort of, you know, as we say, it's one day at a time. One day at a time, mm -hmm. I let it go. Until now, it's over two and a half years with no pizza. Good for you. Good for now, you. Now we've worked on to the next layer of chips. And, of course, I went in uninformed thinking, well, I gave up pizza. Chips are going to be easy. Oh, no. No, mm -hmm. no, no, no. Chips are not going. Chips suddenly, you know, in the cartoon when the smoke turns into hands and like, yes, goes, come with me. Come, yes. come, with come me. hither. Come hither. That's very chips, seductive. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But we're at about three and a half months with no chips. Good for you. So, and I'm only saying good for you because these are things that you've wanted yeah. to free yourself from. Not like, oh, good for you for not eating pizza. Like, it's not about the thing. It's about like insert pizza, heroin, uh, chips, cocaine, or alcohol, Shopping, or sucking yes, dick, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> Boom, Oops, hit sorry, them all. Sorry, She's Roderick. A, no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Roderick's not going to take that out. I won't okay. let him. All um, right, yes. But all of the addictions, right? If it's yeah. sex addiction, if it's shopping addiction, yeah. if it's drinking, if it's drugs, yeah. to some people in some places in their recovery, if yeah. the pizza is becoming a drug type thing, if the chips yeah. are becoming a problem, then it's a way of finding that yeah. thing. For me, restricting was the thing, right? And then I would lose control and then I would be so upset I lost control. Yeah. Um, so the restricting, that's what I always go back to is I will find very insidious ways to not eat. I'll and find very it, yeah. sneaky ways. And I will have periods of that. Mm. And even when we went into quarantine, you know, it was always my dream to just be left alone and do whatever I want and not have to go out into the world and interact with people. And here the world had handed it to me. Mm -hmm. And I was working from home and I was working a lot and I would have days where suddenly it would be three o'clock and I hadn't eaten anything. And suddenly mm. the restricty brain went, well, you made it to three o'clock. Right. How about you, a couple more hours? Let's see if you can make it to six o'clock. Let's see yeah, if you can make it to Yeah, if you do something right now, clean your house, start doing something. You won't even think about it. Well, just finish it after this task. You'll eat after your next task. Oh, just yeah. put it off a little bit longer. Well, if you did it this long, just a little bit longer. Why don't you just, oh, yeah. now go out, clean your car or, or whatever. Insert yeah. task. Yep. I hear that. And, and my sponsor at the time, I was reporting my food and they're like, what is happening? Because they're seeing, like, where's your food? <laughs> exactly. I'm seeing, you know, one meal and it's not even a meal. And when did you eat that meal? I'm You're not eating until nine o'clock at night and that's all you're eating. And and I think it was my reaction to the world's out of control. There's one thing I can control. And and for people who've never restricted, um you get high off of restriction. Mm -hmm. There is yes. there is a 
not just a sense of accomplishment, but your body, body literally, you get buzzy and high off of it. Yeah, yeah. And here I was in my apartment, all this crazy, and I, but I was just buzzing and feeling it and having a great time and feeling yep. good at this time when everyone was feeling horrible. Mm-hmm. And I could do that by not eating. Mm-hmm. And luckily I had a sponsor during that. And she was like, yeah, this is because for me, you know, I, I, it goes like this and, and, and I will, maybe the day will come where I won't look at the restricting as the high point, mm-hmm. but in my mind, restricting is still the gold standard. Mm. And the low point right. down in the mud is whenever I eat anything mm-hmm. is down in the There's mud. There's still like a morality of behavior. It's still in there in my head. It's mm-hmm. still in there in my head for some reason. Um, but uh, so I'll I'll still go there. But now I, again, you know, I live by myself. I've got cats who aren't going to tell anyone what I ate. Um mm-hmm. But, but you the, had that sponsor to hold you accountable I had in that sponsor moment. To hold me mm-hmm. accountable, and I think that's that's the main thing is, you know, this disease wants us isolated and alone. Mm-hmm. Much like a lot of political groups that like to isolate and then attack. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> it works the same. It works the same way. I'm just doing yeah. it to myself. Exactly. Um. But that being said, and I think the other thing that I've started to realize as I continue to work my program and do the writing and do everything else is, and this is going to seem weird considering, you know, you know me as someone who does burlesque. All I've Mm -hmm. ever wanted my whole life is to be invisible Mm -hmm. because I was a curvy female in this world and that meant I got attention I didn't want. I mm-hmm. wanted to be invisible. Leave me alone. Mm-hmm. Well, I tried to get really small and that didn't work. Mm-hmm. But when you're female and you're really big, you're also invisible. Mm. And so, you know, I have to deal with how, but then, but then people, and I had a sponsor who was like, you want to be invisible, but you know, you're on stage taking off your clothes. Mm-hmm. I don't understand how the inside of my brain works, but well, you've chosen that in that moment. Yeah. Yes. And that's, yeah. that's the, I, I relate to that very much because I am someone who also will get on stage, take yeah. off my things, be hyper. We want to be seen as a hypersexual being or person or thing or celebrate my sexuality, whatever that is. Yeah. And then when I'm not working, like, I don't want that kind of attention. I don't yeah. want to be on display. I don't want yeah. people approaching me. I don't want to be talked to. Like, it is all in the autonomy of choosing to, in this yeah. moment, in this character, I would like to do this now. And now I would like not to. I totally yeah. get that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, it's interesting to see. And the reality is, yes, I am in a bigger body. Um, there's, th- this is what it is. This is my journey. If my higher power wants me to get to a certain size, then I will get there. Mm-hmm. It's not my, and it's not on my schedule. Mm-hmm. Now, Would I, you know, and and as you know about me, I do the hooping and the fire and all that. Mm -hmm. Would I like to, there's things I want to do with my body because I do those things, Mm -hmm. but doesn't stop me from hooping Mm -hmm. when I was doing it the other day, you know, because I often do it while I'm waiting for my car to fill at the gas station. And I would like to see that, please. Please, somebody put this on TikTok, please. <laughs> but it's just like, you know, and it's, it's, I'm not doing it for anyone else. I'm doing it for me. Right. Um, Which to me is very different for me for performing because when I'm performing, I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for the audience. You know? You're so nice. Well, You're such a nice performer. That's such a giving uh, because I, as a performer, go out there and saying, like much like I'm taking dogs for a walk, I'm going for a walk. You're lucky to join me. <laughs> and you're you're so caring about the. Although I will say I never desert them. So when I turn my back to my audience, they know I've never turned my back to them, and I teach yeah. that way. Never and the turn view your back is on fabulous your, anyway. So who cares? They want to see it, but know that I've mm. never turned my back on them. I've never yeah. deserted them. Yeah, I'm I'm a good doggy keeper master person. Yes. Um, Yes. I love that. It's funny. I have one performer who we used to perform at a place that didn't have a stage and you'd have to walk through the bar. 
Mm -hmm. which the first time I had to do that, I'm like, what am I going to do? Because all my training has been be on stage and do a thing. And then I, right. and now I love it. And there's another performer. She said, well, I'm going to go sit out front because I'm going to watch Ambrosia feed the animals. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what's going on. And I That's just, exactly what's going on. And I'm so lucky because of the people, you know, Mia Morte, who has just taught me so much. She's like, you know, you have to figure out what your intention is. Mm hmm. And and really, these producers have put their faith in you and the audience has put their faith in you. Mm -hmm. You go out there and I think I'm going to go have a good time. Come with me. Mm -hmm. Let's go have some fun. Mm -hmm. You know, and people expect you to be good and entertaining. Like nobody shows up and it's like, well, this is going to be shitty. I'm glad I spent money. <laughs> Like you yes. just don't, right? You don't yeah. as a per, as a person who pays money to go see shows, or even yeah. if you haven't paid and you've showed up. If yeah. someone's getting on a stage or has stepped into the light of a performance situation, right. you expect them to be good. And good is interesting to me. Good yeah. is entertaining. It doesn't mean that like, oh, well, I've seen someone get their leg up higher. No, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. Good. I'm talking about can is entertaining and interesting. Yeah. That's what people really want to see is interesting. I, I, I actually don't think anybody wants to see anything even good. I think they'd rather see interesting. <laughs> if there was a, if there's, think about it. How yeah. long can you watch a ballet for? That yeah. is peak good. You can't get better than a professional principal ballerina. They right. are the epitome of what a body can do in grace and perfection yeah. of technique and dance. It's a very old art form. Yeah. After about an hour, you're like, all right, cool. Like I've I got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. After about an hour, you're like, I'm just listening to the sound of the shoes on the stage because it's kind right. of a cool noise. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, however, if someone is an interesting, which is what I think we are always yeah. really drawn to that, if you can stay interesting, people are interested. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so the I love I love you doing burlesque stuff. I love I have yet to get to see you perform. Unfortunately, I've seen pictures. I've seen some videos. <laughs> I am like very into it. I want to see you perform very much. So um, in your early burlesque career, you have a story about a woman that came up yes. to you and said something. Will you yes. share that story? Well, um, you know, I took classes. Or it might be, no, this is a more recent story. Um, you well, said you were going to retire or you didn't know no, if you wanted to Well, that's through. just, that's for me. And I always hearken back to that memory. Um, okay. And I took my first burlesque classes that I took were um, with Penny Starr Jr. And uh, as part of that, you would perform at uh, at Skinny's over in North Hollywood, California. Yep. And um, we did a show as a group, and then we each got to step out and have a solo. And um, and I didn't really think it, because I just, I love my people that I were in my group with, and we were having such a good time. And Penny was such a great producer and teacher. And, um, you know, we did the show and, and I didn't know enough to know to like bring a cover up. So I'm just there in like my little nude bejeweled panties and my pasties. And we're just walking around because she said, you need to go talk to the audience. And this woman walked up to me and, and she had tears in her eyes and she just said, oh, my God, I didn't know we got to be sexy. And it was news to me because I didn't realize I was sexy because I was just trying to remember the choreography and all the stuff mm -hmm. that I had to do. And the really funny part is as she was standing there talking to me, this guy walked by and he walked right into the post because he was busy staring at my boobs. <laughs> and I just like, yeah, you could do that, too. You know, uh -huh. so, um, yeah, it just it's. What is attractive and interesting Mm -hmm. is so subjective. Mm -hmm. No one gets to make that decision for anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a as a big bodied person or a person whose weight has fluctuated, I will tell you I have been in relationships more of my life than I have not been in relationships. Mm -hmm. So you ain't got no problem finding someone who Girl, I wants can to be with you. Girl, I when I need the D, all right? That's all I'm saying. Direct quote, everybody. Direct That's right. quote. <laughs> um, and it just, I don't get to make that decision for anyone. And no one gets to make that decision for me. And I, ha I had an experience quite recently where um, I... I, ha I had years ago prepared a spoof of a TED talk on dick pics. Nice. And for 12 Inches of Sin, a show, a, an event that used to happen in Las Vegas. And, and it is what you all are thinking. And mm -hmm. um, 
And so I did it recently. Tuesday Thomas does a thing called Comedy Church. And she said, oh, you know, come do that. And so I, I went and I set it all up and I have I have a, a PowerPoint that I did. And there's probably about 30 pictures of different penises in there. And these are these penises that have been sent to you unsolicited? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, some of them I did kind of bait the water a little bit. Okay, and okay. just wrote the world's most unappealing uh, post and got a bunch of penises sent to me. Right. Pictures of so you, bait, you baited it a little bit, a little but bit. it was still yeah. unsolicited. You weren't saying, please send me your genitals. No, 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 okay. no. Yes. And I also did a thing of like, you know, people have been wanting to show us their penises for, you know, I did the history of dick pics, you know, there's park and career or something. It's nothing but statues of penises. It's been happening mm. for years. And about halfway through, it was a small audience, and about halfway through, about five people got up and walked out. Were they men or women? It was two men and three women. And okay. four of the people were laughing. One of As them, they're walking out? No, no, during, no. While I was doing the presentation. Okay, okay. But one of them was very uncomfortable, and Tuesday told me she could see that he was texting the other people in the group. Okay. And they all got up and walked out. Because maybe their dicks were up there unsolicited. <laughs> Either that or they were having feelings about the dicks. I don't know. I don't really care. But I have never, I am fortunate that I've been in a situation that if someone didn't like seeing me perform, I've mm -hmm. never known about it. Right. No one's ever come up to me and said anything negative. Amazing. If they if they left, you know, I I didn't know about it. Um, no one ever, you know, booed me or anything like that. And so this is my first time I've ever seen people react like that to something. Now, the really funny part is I did not take off any of my clothes. Right. So they walked out in your your Ted Dick Dick presentation, but they've never walked out when you're taking off your clothes. Yeah. And was this not for a comedy thing? This it was, was for, for a comedy, comedy thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Just yeah. taking notes. Just want to yeah. make sure I got the story right. Okay. So it's just, it's, to me, it was really interesting because I had never experienced that. And then it was just like, wow, of all the times that I have gotten up on stage mm -hmm. and hula hooped in a pair of panties and pasties, mm -hmm. and I've never had anyone do that. All mm -hmm. I've ever, all I've ever experienced is people coming up going, oh my God, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, or, you know, I do the fire tassels and people think that's crazy. And, you know, mm -hmm. I like to say I'm a bear on a bicycle. I'm a big fat woman who hula hoops and sets my tits on fire. Um, and, you know, people seem to like it. I don't know. Well, the thing that I think people need to know about burlesque is that, there has been a commercialization of burlesque that we know of in popular culture, which is like the movie burlesque, which I don't think is an adequate representation. Um, and there is like the very old throwback of what most people would think in their mind's eye of the 40s and 50s burlesque, which it has an even deeper history than that. However, um, what burlesque is today a lot of is it is a very, very close knit, very broad underground community that spans all all medias, all different types of shows. And burlesque is for everybody, meaning every body. So you will see every body type, every sexual orientation, every trans, like there is everything that does. everybody can do burlesque and everybody does burlesque. So because so much of it is about a character, a performance, a situation, a shtick, yeah. it's the word burl means joke in burlesque. So there is a lot of humor yes. um, associated with it. And so it is, this is the thing that I think I wouldn't be surprised if burlesque is next on the chopping block because it's so closely drag. A lot of people will do drag in burlesque. I have done it. Yeah, I have done drag in burlesque. So the fact that, and this is what I think the real underlying issue is, it's not about the kids, it's about the acceptance of people and bodies, right? And if you accept everyone, who do you have to fight against? Well, I think it's also about sexuality. Agreed. And I think that, the you know, the people who are going after all of these things are, because the real, reality is, and Roderick, get ready to take this all out, I don't really care what everyone does with their bits. Yeah. I don't care. 
you know, as a straight person, I never had to sit down with my mom and go, mom, I really love sucking dick. Right. It was not a conversation. Right. No straight parent is going to kick out their straight child because they're like, I, I really love doing it doggy style. Right. I, I don't care what people. It's not a conversation with. that has to be had. No, I don't really care. Now, if you're an asshole, I don't want to know you. <laughs> but, but, you know, but I think that people who have issues with their own sexuality really get uncomfortable when the rest of us are like, yeah, this is a thing and I do it. This is, you know, we all, we all have bodies. We all are sexual mm -hmm. people. But I think for people who have, have been traumatized around it or whatever, they want to control everyone else because they themselves have, someone's either tried to control them or make them do something they didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the funny thing is, and, and to drag queens, I love you. I love you, love you, love you. Mm -hmm. They're not always, drag queens are rarely sexual. They're sexy right. and they're body and they're funny. And they're funny. And they're filthy and they, they, they curse and they talk about politics and all of it. But they're never up there, you know, doing a lot of what we do in burlesque, mm -hmm. you know, where I'm like playing, I, you know, and I'm licking my own boob or something like that. Or Yeah, we're you know, legit taking off our clothes. You know, and, 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 and literally putting a frame around the bits that nobody wants to talk about, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I think that that's, that's part of it. And I think it's funny because being bigger bodied doesn't mean that I'm owed a spot on that stage. I have to earn that spot on that stage. I have to earn that by training to learn how to do the hula hoop mm -hmm. and training to learn how to eat fire and training to take dance classes and learn how to take things off. There are performers who've been in this business for a very long time and God damn it, if they don't get stuck in their bra every time I see them, mm -hmm. but I love them, you know, um, it taking it, your clothes off is an art people. You know, it's it's not as and it's so funny. I think I'd probably been doing burlesque for about three years and I went shopping with a friend who was trying to buy uh, a gown to wear to their son's wedding. Mm -hmm. And they tried to like put it on over their head. And I'm like, girl, you do not put a gown on over your head. It is not mm -hmm. a T-shirt. I said, you mm -hmm. need to imagine that there's someone in the room that you really want to think you're sexy. And then you step into that gown and you wiggle up into that gown. Wiggle it up. And you wiggle get that it up. gown on. And then you turn around and you ask them to zip you up. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing in reverse when we do burlesque. What's this? Yeah. Oh, no, not yet. Yes. No, 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 no. No, you're not getting it yet. You haven't earned it. You got to yes. earn this shit. Yes. You got to earn it. And in burlesque, we they earn it. By hooting and hollering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, now you've earned a little bit because you paid your ticket and you put your butt in the seat. And I'm like, but right. if you want their, if you want, and pe performers who two seconds in do the gimme gimme, you just told me mm -hmm. that's the best you're going to do for the night. You've lost me. Mm -hmm. Yep. You've just shown me the best you have mm -hmm. if you do the gimme gimme. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty of people who think my body is sexy. For mm -hmm. whatever reason. Some of them it's a fetish. So it, it mm -hmm. is whatever it is. But you know what's really important? I think my body is sexy. That is what's most important. That's the hardest thing to get to for everyone to love themselves on that level. Yeah. It's so hard to do. Like, regardless of what you look like. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're the most beautiful person in the world, more, st st you know, stereotypically whatever. If you don't feel that way about yourself, it's yeah. it's a rough road. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a rough road, not just on stage as a burlesque performer, because I watch friends who are in perfect packages and their lives are not any easier. Their relationships are not any better. They still get treated poorly by the people that they're pursuing romantically. Mm -hmm. What they weigh has nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. that's that's not what it's all about mm -hmm. that's not what it's all about now 
that being said, again, I, as a human, I hold my space in this planet. Mm -hmm. I'm not owed anything just because I'm fat. I can, I can be a good person, I can be talented, I can be hardworking, but the container has nothing to do with that. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have anything to do with that. That's all up here in my noggin, mm-hmm. you know, but does it help for me to go up on stage and be someone who's comfortable with my, I remember when I was in program and they, they have uh, some people who do the body image uh, workshop. They do it every mm-hmm. year, every, okay. and I got the, and I said, oh, I, th- I should go take this. And my boyfriend said, um, honey, you don't have any body image problems. You don't need to go to that workshop. He said, maybe you could go teach that workshop, but you don't need to go to that workshop. Amazing. <laughs> so of all the douchey things he ever, that was like one of the sweetest things he ever said. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? That's true. And mm-hmm. the really funny thing is when they've had events and stuff like that, no one wants me to do burlesque at an OA event. Why? I think you know the answer. I want you to tell me the answer. Because even in this program, with all these people who are working, you know, for so many people, whether they've been abstinent and lost a lot of weight or they're no longer purging, Mm -hmm. my body, as it is, is a trigger for so many of them. Because I, in this body... And their worst nightmare. Now the secret is. The body's not the scariest part of me. <laughs> That's yeah. in the ear. In the brain. Yeah. 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 And I I have noticed. OA has been a great resource for me. Because for the most part it's been so inclusive. And I see myself and everybody. And it's been like really great to relate to a bunch of people who have been through it and found some recovery. And it has, I do feel like it has been the most significant helpful thing for me in my recovery. Now I'll also preface it that I had a sponsor. I don't have one right this second. I have not done the steps in OA. I go to meetings and even lately I haven't been going to meetings, Right. but I do drop in. If I start getting weird, if I start falling off of what I would call my abstinence or my sobriety and what I try to you know, adhere it to, to be healthy. Um, I'm, I'm, my butt's in a seat and I have no problem doing all that stuff. Um, but I did notice there is a fixation or a focus. I don't even want to say a fixation. There's a focus on larger body people getting small. Like that's the success of the program. And I actually, the literature in that program repels me, not just because I'm, uh, a, a quote unquote normal weight. I've always been a normal weight, whether it's my heaviest or my least, you know, like it's still a normal, acceptable way, even when I was fucking starving and eating 800 calories a day and, and working out like a crazy person, I was still a quote unquote normal weight. But in the literature so much in a way, it speaks so much about no matter how far down the scale we've gone, yes. you know, we like, I'm like, uh, that is not helpful for me. And so you just like, you just pat, you're like, okay, that doesn't apply to me moving on. But I, I really, it's always bothered me for larger body people too, because I don't think that that should be the goal because I don't know what everyone's body should be. Like, I don't think everybody has the same body type and I don't think everybody should be at the same weight. And I don't know what that is. And I think it can be really detrimental for larger body people. It like continues the stereotype that if you're not small, you're unhealthy. If you're not small, you're not okay. If you're not smaller, there's something wrong with you. If you're not small, you haven't been successful. If you're not small, you're not well. And I just don't think that to be true. And it's, I think the other thing too is, um, I totally agree with what you're saying because I'll have moments where I'm like, really? So should I just go? Is that the deal? Should I just leave now? Um, we're all on our own time frame. Mm -hmm. And for me, the, one of the biggest things that I've gotten from program is faith because I had none when I went into program. Mm-hmm. You know, if people used the word God, I would start deducting IQ points. Same. It was really hard for me and it yeah. still is hard for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I use universe. I use higher mm-hmm. power. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I do realize that there, because, you know, and that was the thing that sponsor I talked about that I was so grateful for that, that we, you know, we almost came to blows over that because I realized that in my family, religion was used as a punishment mm-hmm. and that was my experience of it. 
-hmm. But now to realize that there is an entity that makes the waves crash on the shore and the leaves come out. That's not me. Mm -hmm. So clearly it's way better at all of this than I am. Right. And so who am I to tell it, oh, I need to be X amount of pounds by this date. That's not my job. Now, what I have been given is I have miraculously have no desire to eat pizza. Mm -hmm. You know, I've gone X amount of time without chips. I also don't stand in the shower and have imaginary conversations from experiences 10 years ago like I used to have because those would then make me feel like crap and then I'd go eat something. Oh, yeah, the sh- the shower conversations. Oh, yeah, oh, I, blah, 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 blah. I still can get on that tip all the time. My favorite times is like um like fake shower arguments that I have with people. And then also um right before I go to bed, you know, yeah. thinking about like all the worst things yeah. ever. Yes. Yeah. Kind of my show. <laughs> and that that I have that I have learned to turn that over. I, mm-hmm. I'm not perfect. And that's mm-hmm. the other thing that I've learned is I don't have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. because for a really long time, I thought I had to be perfect for everyone out there. You know, when I was doing the crazy restricting, I remember specifically a man coming up to me and him thanking me for wearing the pants I was wearing because they made my butt look so good. Mm. Well, I had done my job because I had made a man that I didn't even know happy by the way my butt looked. Mm. I think about that. I'm like, oh, my God. What? Right. That was my goal. That's what was important to me. Well, that's what's told to us as yes. importance, right? That yes. being uh, pleasing to the male gaze is the ultimate compliment for a woman. It is how yes. she stays desirable. It's how she can maintain space in the world. Is yes. where her value, her beauty, and her looks are her currency in the world. Yes. It is the only thing that can get her things and that it will even in a strange way, keep her safe. And that, in my opinion, comes from white supremacy. Um, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It it (laughs) just, yeah, that's a whole, that's, but I'm, I am, I'm in charge of making sure I have on clean underwear, my cats are fed and my bills are paid. Mm -hmm. The size of this body, it's going to go where it's going to go. I've spent my Mm -hmm. whole life trying to control it and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. But what I know has worked is turning it over to a higher power, reaching out when I'm telling someone like, "Uh, I've just circled the box of macaroni and cheese three times. Something's not right. I need you to talk Mm -hmm. to me about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, those kinds, those kinds of things. And I understand for people who don't have this, they're like, why is she so, you know, vexed by a box of macaroni and cheese? Mm hmm. Because that box of macaroni and cheese says that it's for four people. But trust me, it will all be gone if I make that box of macaroni and cheese mm-hmm. right now. And you know that about yourself because yeah. you know that's your thing. In this yeah. moment, that's the thing. Yeah. That's the thing that is louder than the real thing that's yeah. going on. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing is to, to live in this world as a large bodied person. And it's funny. I've had, I've had a lot of burlesque performers stay with me. Very thin burlesque performers. And I'm always surprised at what slobs they are. (laughs) Sorry. I'm not saying that, but some, and I always think, you know, if someone came in and they saw the sloppy room versus the clean room, they'd think my room was the sloppy room. Right. Because of the connotations of whatever that is. Because I'm big and fat and I'm sitting around eating frosting out of a can and I don't clean and I'm slovenly and I smell and every, could be farther Mm -hmm. from the truth. To the Mm -hmm, point mm -hmm. where I had a therapist who told me, okay, I need you to spend a weekend where you don't clean anything. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Because I lived my life thinking that house and garden was going to knock on my door at any moment. Everything better be picture perfect. Mm -hmm. The house better be picture perfect. I better be picture perfect. Everything better be picture perfect. Well, we all know. Mm -hmm. The picture may be perfect, but if you pan out, someone's like holding this thing with a clip and there's not really a tree there. Right. You know. So all of the all of the magic. Yes. Yeah. I think that's like a great metaphor, too, for people's mind. And I loved that analogy you talked about, you know, all the the mental weight. Right. Like how how much mental weight have we all lost and why doesn't that qualify? It's not quantifiable. So therefore, it almost doesn't 
qualify. But that's the biggest piece that we normally gain from recovery is that kind of peace or that presence or that loss of mental weight. If you, you know, went into someone's brain, like someone who is smaller bodied may have a much dirtier mental brain than you. And that, you know, you're standing here saying, I'm fine with myself. I accept myself. I love my, I, I'm good. And someone like me could be like, I fucking hate myself. I want to crawl out of my own fucking skin. I cannot tolerate the space I'm taking up right now. Yeah. You know, and you just can't tell. You will have no way of knowing when you look at somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't. And it's it's so interesting. I think back to a while back. I used to love to watch Bill Maher. And I don't know if you have to take his name out or whatever. But there was a woman on there who talked about people dying from anorexia and bulimia. Mm hmm. And you would have thought she had just told him, you know, that Sasquatch was his father. Right. He was like, no way is that happening. Because in his mind, he didn't really care how it was the, that the women got to be thin as long as they were thin. Right. He couldn't believe that women doing anything that they needed to do to be thin could be seen as something detrimental for them. I mean, this, this, it was really interesting to the point where I'm like, I literally was going to find out where he lived and just go hula hoop in his driveway <laughs> and be like, look at my big fat body hooping in your driveway, little man. And mm -hmm. and and I'd always thought of him as an intelligent person. I mean, I know he's a little mm -hmm. controversial, but it was just like it was so disappointing to see mm -hmm. like, oh, wow, you don't really care if the inside of that person is tortured and in pain or anything as long as that package looks right right the self harm doesn't matter as long as you look right and pleasing for me and what society has decided exactly. it should be which and who are those i always point out who are those people who are saying that because i think we're starting to see as more minority people come into into uh positions of power that ideal is changing yeah. Or as the consumer decides that they want to see themselves represented and not the status quo, that is changing. But for then, for a while, and for still now, a majority, who is making those decisions? And what what classification are them are they? Because it's usually not a super diverse group of people. Yeah. Yeah. I do think on the other side of it, and I don't know if you've been aware, you know, there was a thing a while back where a burlesque an old one of our legends uh, posted a picture and said, back when I was working, this was what people said was burlesque. And they posted a picture of someone very thin. Mm -hmm. And everyone was so quick to jump on them. How dare you say that? It, it, burlesque is for it. But, but I don't think that's what that, that legend was saying because through my relationship with Satan's angel, and you know, back then... Satan's angel is a very well-known burlesque yes. queen. Yes, for um, people who might not know. Yeah, and her, her career was, you know, the 50s and the 60s, the 70s. Mm -hmm. And she told me they would, they would go to clubs and not their, not their managers who would book the job, but the club owners would make them strip down naked and get on a scale. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't weigh what that owner wanted, they didn't mm -hmm. work that night. Mm -hmm. That's not that long ago that these women were treated that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what this legend was trying to say was, you know, if I gained five pounds, I didn't work. Right. Like there was no acceptance in a lot of the situation. No. And you could probably get away with a little more weight if your tits were gigantic. But yeah. that's the only way you couldn't be gigantic everywhere. You had to just have yeah. gigantic tits. Yeah. But I, and I think, like, yeah, Go if ahead. Marilyn Monroe was pear shaped and didn't have tits. I don't know if that would have been the same. Like, would she have been allowed in those? Probably not. Right. Right. And it just, you know, there's, there's, I love the fact that, that we are becoming more, our eyes are opening to the fact that, yes, it's not just, we just don't all fall out of that Barbie mold. Mm -hmm. Barbie's, Barbie's great. People who love Barbie, that's great. But the things that women have had to do to themselves to be a Barbie and mm -hmm. fight against their own DNA. Some women mm -hmm. can have that body and they just wake up like that. One arm's up in the air. They're steering the car with the other. There they go. They're off. <laughs> um, I have to use both hands when I drive. 
I, I am flat footed. Um, I don't walk around <laughs> on my tippy toes every day. So I suffer from having to use my heel arch yeah. toe to walk ball of foot. Uh, yeah. Some women, I guess, just w- walk in a perpetual tippy toe high heel walk. I've they heard. May, and that's and that's great. But I mean, that's I really- don't know anybody who does that. But I'm just saying maybe well, I, I did see Dita's show recently. She does spend a lot of time barefoot walking around on her tippy toes. OK. All right. So Dita Dita's a magical it. unicorn. So there's yes. That. Um, but it's. I'm not any less deserving of my spot in the world. As anyone else. Mm-hmm. Now, as a bigger bodied person. I'm not going to deny that to anyone who's not a bigger bodied person either. Cause it, it seems like it can sometimes swing in the other direction. Mm-hmm. You know, we need to, we need to give the same respect that we want to get in the situation. Right. And are you talking about like the idea of like, if someone is thin, it's like, well, eat a hamburger. Like you're too thin. You're like that kind of body shaming on the other spectrum yes. with that person that may be their natural body. Yes. We don't know. They could just be very naturally thin. Yes. And they're getting flack for being and, and whoever they are. Yeah, they're getting that too. You know, it's just, it's, and the thing that I've learned and the thing that I've heard so many times in program, and that's what is it, this dis-ease or dis-ease in general mm-hmm. is the great equalizer. I remember taking a class uh, from Vixen DeVille and uh, it was a group of women, and there was me, another woman who was a little fluffier, uh, who was fluffy, not as fluffy as me, but fluffy. And then, you know, traditional Barbie, strut and peel looking gals. Mm-hmm. And the exercise was pick a body part and tell me about why you love that body part. Because that's really what we do in burlesque. Look at my mm-hmm. arm. Mm-hmm. This is the bet. Don't you want these mm-hmm. hands to look at these? You present it Ooh. first. Yep. You present whatever you're going to uh, before you're about to do it. You yeah. present that thing. You're yes. going to make them want to see it. This mm-hmm. is just an arm with a glove, but I am mm-hmm. really going to mm-hmm. make you want to see it. as lo- mm-hmm. Myself and the other fluffy lady, I picked my boobs. She picked her butt. We talked about how much we love them. Every other Barbie-shaped woman in the room told us what they didn't like about their body. Mm -hmm. I think that's a conversation that everyone's having. Mm -hmm. It's one of the hardest questions And I don't think it's just women. I think men have it too. Oh, for sure. I think men have it too. Mm -hmm. And my personal theory is that is what fuels persecuting people who are other Mm. because we're not happy in here. We're going to make the right. I'm going to go to hell. I'm taking you with me. That's deep. You know, it's, it's, if you can't have a sense of satisfaction and peace inside yourself and you've tried all the things, then you're just going to try to make everyone else as miserable as you are. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jada, my friend who has a master's, I've had her on twice. Um, she talks about a lot about when someone hears something that they, that hits too close to home, right? The first thing that they do is they, um, she even uses the word purge. They purge it. They, and so what they do is they push back. They, um, say something terrible. They try to get it away from them and they, like project or try to get it onto someone else um so and i i just thought of that when you're talking about this because that's kind of the response and i completely agree yeah i come that that statement is a statement when i hear it i'm like that's true yeah that's true yeah and so i always think about you know um anyone who's bullying or saying something negative about someone or, or, you know, making fun of someone for the way they look, all you're really telling me is that's the thing about yourself that you're not happy with. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's not my problem. I, somebody said your problem with me is your problem. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's not me. Right. You know, and I find, huh? So good. You know, 
normal. You learn shit, you know. <laughs> I don't know if people would think you're that old when they see you on stage doing what you do. <laughs> well, we'll see. So I'm working on a new act. So we'll see how that goes. Over. Yes. And, and for those of you, if you do see the little clip, Minji's in her costume room. <laughs> she was a little perturbed that we were all going to see it because it's like any costume room or closet. We have our own organizational processes, but it doesn't always look that way. Um, so she was a little bit mortified that I was that anybody might see her. But this is her. This is her. She's in her cave, her costume cave. Um, I have one more question for okay. you. All right. So I know when you and I are programmed, so we uh, at least I'm in a in a program that very much celebrates this, that I am not supposed to give advice. However, would you give, um, do you have any suggestion for uh, someone who might be suffering right now? Reach out to someone. Doesn't matter if it's someone in program. Let someone, do not suffer alone and think that you have to do it alone. You don't have to do it alone. That's what's going to take you down. Amazing. Thank you, Minge. Minge! This is so great. Thank you, thank it's you, thank you, thank so you, thank good you. To, to stare at your face for this long. Likewise, likewise. <laughs> and I want to see you perform well. Like, I need to. I need to. <laughs> So will you please, like, I'm not always staying up to date on everything that's going on on the interwebs. So if you have a date, will you please let me know? Yeah. Well, you know, once this act is done and I, I debut it, I will let you know because this, okay. is, this is one I'm very excited about. So I just want to see. I need to see Ambrosia Minge. I need to see <laughs> thank you. The, the legend. I need to see it. Minge, thank you for coming on. Thank, thank you for you. being honest. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for inviting me because, again, it's just like I feel so fancy to get to be on a podcast that I listen to all the time. I love that you support it. Thank you. Oh, Thank great. you for listening. Thank you. Minge is the first person I remember meeting that really challenged my preconceived notion of what an eating disorder, quote unquote, looked like. Perhaps I became so fixated on her dichotomy because I didn't look like what an eating disorder, quote unquote, looked like either. Every time she shared, I heard my own story, and eventually I realized it is all so much more complicated than I'd like it to be. Minge talked about her weight specifically the weight of intense emotional experiences, the weight of what society thinks she should be. And off the record, she spoke of the weight of certain body positivity warriors shaming her for going to Overeaters Anonymous, neglecting to understand the radical idea that the weight Minge most needed to lose was in her mind, a specific weight that so many of us who have suffered are all too familiar with. Minja's grace is on full display. Living as a larger-bodied person in a world that worships thinness, she celebrates body diversity and simultaneously seeks what is truly best for her own mental well-being. She is truly inspirational and an enigma. I hope you found something that resonated in my conversation with Ambrosia Minge today. If you're listening to this episode and you're realizing that you're more like Minge and I than not, welcome. And I hope this helps you take a step in the direction of recovery if you haven't already. You're not alone. Just a reminder for anyone who needs to hear it, you don't need to wait until you're sick enough to get help. In fact, you don't have to be sick at all, just a desire to feel a little better. If you're listening and right now you're struggling with an ED, disordered eating, or other behaviors, welcome. Know that whatever you're feeling, there are those among us that have probably felt it too. You're not alone. If you're listening because you have someone you love in your life that is suffering or is in recovery for an ED, welcome. You are also not alone. Even having an eating disorder myself, I have not always reacted the best I could to others who were struggling before my own recovery. I've attached the do's and don'ts of how to deal with someone suffering in the show notes, as well as how to contact Ambrosia Minge and myself 
and various links for help and recovery when and if you're ready. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you were able to find something relatable in today's episode. As I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, this is also a social experiment to see if in telling my story, I can embolden listeners to share their stories. If you'd like me to read your recovery story on this topic, anonymous or otherwise, on the podcast, please email graymaybestories at gmail.com, G-R-E-Y-M-A-Y-B-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S at gmail.com. Thank you to everyone who helped make this Gray Maybe podcast happen. Producer and editor, Roderick Barge. Cover photo by Jose Perez. Music licensed by Pixabay. Special counsel, Jada Ellingham and Roderick Barge. Special shout out to supporter, Patty Olgan. If you'd like to support this podcast, please rate, share, comment, and subscribe. Until next time, bye for now.